I've said it before and I'll say it again. Forget about hypersonic missiles. The real future of high-speed aviation is in hypersonic aircraft. And while there are several publicly disclosed efforts to field aircraft that can fly at speeds faster than Mach 5, few have garnered as much attention or made as much progress as Hermius. Now, we've spoken about Hermius several times on this channel before, as they've continued to make rapid progress toward fielding the world's first reusable hypersonic aircraft in their Quarter Horse technology demonstrator. And last month, they unveiled Quarter Horse Mark I, the firm's first flying prototype. Let's talk about what we can expect out of this new flying prototype and why Hermius today really reminds me of Lockheed back when they were first establishing their legendary skunk works. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. Last month, hypersonic aviation firm Hermius unveiled their new Quarter Horse Mark I, the firm's first flying technology demonstrator. Now, Quarter Horse Mark I was actually built in just seven months, and in fact, it's the second aircraft Hermius has built in the past year. And that extremely aggressive timeline is not a bug, but rather a feature. You see, Hermius' design philosophy is all about making rapid, iterative improvements to their aircraft designs, allowing for progress at a pace that seems downright superhuman. Hermius was founded in 2018, and by November of 2022, they were already demonstrating their turbine-based combined cycle hypersonic engine called Chimera could successfully transition from turbojet to ramjet power in a high-speed wind tunnel. Less than a year later, Hermius's first prototype, the Quarter Horse Mark Zero, began taxi tests in Tennessee. And now, less than a year after that, Quarter Horse Mark I is set to begin a new battery of tests, which will culminate in actual flight testing, with an emphasis on safe takeoffs and landings. In fact, according to Hermia CEO, AJ Piplica, that's really the primary goal for this platform. Um, we're really trying to learn uh, and get through uh, getting reliable takeoff and landing. That is the, the kind of bare bones, uh, minimum bar requirement uh, for, for Mark I is get through takeoff and landing. Uh, once we can do that, once we've demonstrated kind of like reliable reusability, if I'll, I'll bring a rocket word to the to the airplane world here, uh, once, once we've done that, then um, you, the approach that you can take, the risk that you can take in flight test um, kind of expands exponentially because uh, almost, you know, from any point in your, uh, in your flight test envelope, you can now knock it off, return to base, gather the data, fix things, and, and go back and fly again. Now, Quarter Horse Mark I may be Hermius's first flying prototype, but this is not Piplica's first hypersonic rodeo. In fact, prior to co-founding Hermius, he served as the CEO of a different hypersonic venture called Generation Orbit Launch Services Incorporated, who partnered with the Air Force Research Laboratory on the development of the X-60A liquid-fueled rocket-propelled hypersonic technology demonstrator. In fact, Piplica himself led the development of that platform. And that X-60 program is actually still underway. In fact, today, Generation Orbit is working on the X-60C, a larger hypersonic platform based directly on the X-60A design that Piplica led the development of. Now, when Quarter Horse Mark I starts flying later this year, it'll be powered by only half of Hermius's turbine-based combined cycle Chimera hypersonic propulsion system, specifically the General Electric J85 turbojet half. And that is for a good reason. As I've learned through my conversations with Piplica and Hermia COO Skylar Schuford, their approach to designing these testbed aircraft are to design specifically to meet the needs of their testing regime. And this allows them to make rapid changes to their design throughout each iteration of testing. And thanks to their rapid production tempo, building an average of an aircraft a year, this allows them to not only make multiple iterative improvements on their hypersonic aircraft design in extreme extremely short order, but it also provides very valuable experience for the Hermius team. You see, Hermius' staff has been pulled from all over the aerospace industry, providing a great deal of experience when it comes to developing and fielding new aircraft. But that doesn't change the fact that what Hermius is trying to do has literally never been done before. 
In fact, one could make the argument that Hermias today is picking up right where legendary aeronautical engineer and founder of Lockheed Skunk Works, Kelly Johnson, left off with a little-known platform called the D-21. But to better understand what I mean about that, and the way Hermias today really reminds me of Lockheed Skunk Works back during Kelly Johnson's tenure, we need to take a stroll down memory lane. In the early 1930s, a recent graduate and newly hired tool designer for the still young Lockheed Aircraft Corporation approached the firm's head designer with an audacious claim. This 23-year-old upstart had been a student assistant at the wind tunnel facilities at the University of Michigan, and he thought he'd spotted a problem with the company's new airliner design, a platform that Lockheed had hoped would help the company survive the Great Depression. Now, according to this audacious little whippersnapper, the airplane's design, which had been in development since he had started grad school, was unstable. And it was a claim that he'd made before, in fact, to his college professor back when Lockheed had made use of that university wind tunnel. But his professor just dismissed him outright. But now, as an emboldened new engineer, this same punk kid took his concerns straight to Hal Hibbert, Lockheed's senior-most engineer and the company's corporate administrator. Now, in a testament to Hibbert's professionalism, or maybe his humility, he heard the kid out. And despite the young man's lack of experience, he really did have an uncanny grasp of aerodynamics. In fact, many years down the road, that skill set had proven so valuable that Skunk Works director Ben Rich was quoted as saying, that damn Swede can actually see air. Suffice to say, this new guy may have been young, but he also knew his stuff. So Hibbard sent Lockheed's newest tool designer back to his alma mater to use the university's wind tunnel to take a crack at solving the problems that only he seemed to be able to see. And a few months later, that same young man returned with a revised design, including an entirely new tail section that really completely resolved all of the plane's stability issues. Now, this was an incredible feat for any engineer, let alone one in his early 20s, and Lockheed's management, recognizing that, immediately promoted him out of a tool designing role and into a new job as an aeronautical engineer. Now, that young man, you've probably guessed by now, was Clarence Kelly Johnson, an aerospace wonderkind who'd go on to change the face of aviation as we know it. Johnson would go on to lead the development on the P-38 Lightning, which is the namesake for today's F-35 Lightning II. Johnson was also the mastermind behind the P-80 Shooting Star, America's first ever jet fighter. As Lockheed and the U.S. government came to trust his brilliant engineering and economic pragmatism more and more, he'd go on to establish the dry lake bed testing facility that we know today as Area 51 all while developing and fielding the U-2 spy plane. But from the moment the U-2 entered service, the always forward-thinking Johnson recognized that it was already flying on borrowed time. The rapid advance of Soviet air defense technologies meant that, despite the U-2's ability to fly more than 13 miles above the Earth, it was still only a matter of time before new surface-to-air missiles could reach it. And in 1960, that's exactly what happened when a CIA-operated U-2 piloted by Gary Powers was shot down over the Soviet Union. Altitude was no longer enough to insulate spy planes from harm, but by the time the Air Force came calling for a replacement, Johnson had already done a lot of the preliminary design work on his next creation, a series of high-flying aircraft that would culminate and the now legendary SR-71 Blackbird. The SR-71 was such a departure from the technology of its day that nearly every component of the aircraft had to be reinvented, capable of not just achieving but sustaining speeds in excess of Mach 3 for hours on end. The SR-71 redefined what was seen as possible in aviation so much so that its standing record for sustained supersonic speeds at Mach 3.2 still stands to this very day. But despite Johnson's long list of victories, there was one aircraft design that he never quite made work, a supersonic drone developed using technologies present in the SR-71 and its Archangel precursors that was first known as the Q-12 
and later redesignated the D-21. Now, this ramjet-powered drone flew at sustained speeds of Mach 3.3 and at altitudes of 90,000 feet or more, screaming across the sky with a single high-resolution camera snapping away. It was designed to eject its avionics suite and camera film in a parachute pod that could be recovered in midair by C-130s or from the surface of the ocean by a nearby warship. That's right, all the way back in the early 1960s, Kelly Johnson was designing a Mach 3 ISR drone, and believe it or not, it even saw operational use over China. But the D-21 program saw repeated and sometimes tragic failures. One test launched from the back of a modified A-12, which was the SR-71's predecessor, ultimately destroyed both the drone and the launching aircraft, killing one of the A-12's crewmen. Failure after failure in testing delayed the platform's entry into service, and then once it did get there, all four of its operational flights over China also ended in failure. Even for a man who could see air, fielding an unmanned, ramjet-powered, high supersonic drone was just reaching a bit too far. But it's been a half century since the D-21 was formally retired, and today, Piplica and his team at Hermius are really picking up where Johnson left off, developing their own high-speed ramjet-powered aircraft that promises to unseat Johnson's SR-71 as the fastest reusable jet aircraft in history, with a design that looks a bit like a 21st century reboot of the D-21 itself. Though, as Piplica himself would point out, that may even be a bit of an unfair comparison, because what Hermius aims to do with Quarter Horse is objectively a lot tougher than what the D-21 was designed to accomplish. Oh, so, you know, Quarter Horse takes off and lands on a runway, so it has landing gear. Um, it, it is an airplane. Um, it is uh, fully recoverable, fully reusable, all those things, those, uh, you know, adjectives that I really don't like to talk about because, like, it's an airplane. When we say airplane, it, those things are obvious. Um, it's powered by a gas a gas turbine engine. Um, so uh, there's there's no ramjet on, on Mark II, um, just the uh, just the gas turbine. Um, there's no rocket boosters. So, you know, it achieves its, its speed fully on its own power as a single vehicle. Uh, it's not air launched, anything like that. Um, and it, it's also kind of designed um, for you know, future operational systems to integrate with um, you know, all the things uh, on the Air Force and, and DOD side that, uh, that need to be done. So, um, yeah, I can't speak to the particulars of the performance parameters, obviously, but um, yeah, different. The D-21 was an air-launched platform that was either deployed from the back of a modified A-12 or from under the wing of a B-52 Stratofortress using a rocket booster to get it moving fast enough for its ramjet to function. In a real way, the D-21 was a cruise missile with a camera on board, whereas Quarter Horse aims to be a completely reusable aircraft that takes off and lands on its own, flying hundreds of operational sorties, maybe even more in its lifetime, rather than just ejecting a film canister and self-destructing over enemy territory. But to tell you the truth, the reason why I can't help but see similarities between Hermes today and Lockheed Skunk Works back when the D-21 was in the works has less to do with the fact that Quarter Horse and the D-21 have somewhat similar plane forms, and much more to do with their design and production philosophy. In 1989, Kelly Johnson's memoir, which he co-wrote with author Maggie Smith, entitled Kelly, More Than My Share of It All, reached bookstores, offering us more insight than ever before into the inner workings of the legendary Skunk Works throughout Johnson's nearly four-decade tenure as its director. And just about seven years later, Johnson's successor, Ben Rich, published his book entitled Skunk Works, a personal memoir of my years at Lockheed. And if you read these two books back to back, you get an incredible insight into a nearly six-decade span of Lockheed's development, starting in 1933 when Johnson was hired. That's 
one year after Lockheed was purchased for just $40,000, which today is still less than a million dollars. And that's three years before the U.S. military took delivery on their last biplane. Up through 1975, when Johnson partially retired and passed the baton up to his multiple decades spanning protege, Ben Rich. And straight on through to 1991, when the Skunk Works YF-22 won the U.S. Air Force's Advanced Tactical Fighter Competition to become the F-22 Raptor. And by reading these books back to back, you not only get an incredible insight into the very literally world-changing technology fielded by Lockheed Skunk Works, but you also get an up-close and personal view at how changes in work culture in the United States, new laws meant to combat corruption in government contracting, new classification procedures and security requirements, and a great deal of politically mandated bureaucracy changed the way advanced aircraft programs are carried out. From Johnson and a handful of engineers literally renting a circus tent to hide the development of America's first jet fighter from other Lockheed employees, to today's Skunk Works, which alone employs more than 3,700 people in facilities spanning three different states, with more than 500 projects on the book and multiple layers of both internal and governmental oversight for each one. And while the mega corporation that is today's Lockheed Martin and the brilliant engineers of its Skunk Works division continue to change the face of aerospace technology, it's tough to deny the fact that as the decades wore on, Lockheed's success drove them further and further away from Kelly Johnson's rulebook of 14 rules and practices he established for small, empowered, and streamlined teams that could field absolutely game-changing aircraft in very short periods of time. And frequently, with money to spare. There are few organizations in history to have had as much of an impact on aviation and even on warfare as a whole as Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works. And the secret sauce that made that possible, at least in my estimation, are four traits that Kelly Johnson brought to the job and then looked for in the team that he recruited. Starting with the most obvious, which is an extreme degree of technical prowess. And I'm not just talking about understanding tech well enough to use it or even to build it, but to see beyond the limits of today's technology in such a broad and abstract way that you can conceive of applications that might even seem impossible to your contemporaries and then come up with concrete steps to get there. But that prowess has to be tempered by the second trait, which is a grounded or pragmatic optimism, where you do believe you're capable of doing these seemingly impossible things, but you also recognize the very real technical, financial, or technological limitations of your circumstances, allowing you to sift through the whole bucket of your seemingly impossible ideas to choose the ones that not only might work, but could work with the resources and timeline you have. And that leads to the third, and I'd argue maybe even the most important trait, though some would contend that it's not a positive trait at all, and that is sheer audacity. At just 23 years old, Kelly Johnson not only had the technical prowess to identify a problem with Lockheed's new aircraft design, but he also had the audacity to trust himself over the collective experience of Lockheed's engineering team. And after his professor dismissed him, Johnson had the audacity to stick to his guns, waiting until he got a job at Lockheed to take his concerns directly to the company's senior most engineer. Johnson and his Skunk Works team had the audacity to believe they could build an aircraft that could fly at sustained speeds in excess of Mach 3 for hours on end, something no aircraft in service today can do, something so technologically infeasible at the time that the only material they could find to build the aircraft out of was titanium they had to buy through CIA shell corporations from the Soviet Union, something so seemingly impossible that they couldn't even use glass for the windshield and instead had to use one and a quarter inch pieces of solid quartz because glass would melt in those flight conditions. 
And then, after more than 40 years of Kelly Johnson changing the world of aeronautical design, fielding platforms like the P-80, the U-2, and the SR-71, Ben Rich stepped in and had the audacity to dismiss Kelly Johnson when he told him stealth wouldn't work and he should wash his hands of this silly, hopeless diamond idea. Ben Rich, who worked under Kelly Johnson for more than two decades, who said that damn Swede can see air, had the audacity to think that he and his team could be right where Johnson was wrong, to believe they could change the world again by fielding the F-117. And today, AJ Piplica, Skyler Shuford, and the rest of the team at Hermius have the audacity to believe that they can take a turbofan engine developed more than 50 years ago and marry it up to ramjet technology that's been around for nearly a century, build an airframe around this exotic new propulsion system, and do something that no one has ever been able to do before. Not even Kelly Johnson. Last year, I got to tour Hermius's classified Atlanta facility, and I walked through one room where they were 3D printing titanium, and then another room where they were developing the flight control software to control these aircraft at hypersonic speeds, and then another room where they were developing the Chimera 1 turbine-based combined cycle engine that promises to make hypersonic flight possible. Now, I'm not here to say AJ Piplica or anyone else on the Hermius team is already the next Kelly Johnson, but what I am saying is that this Hermius team has the technical prowess, they have the pragmatic optimism, and they have the audacity to change the world all over again. I wasn't born early enough to see Kelly Johnson and his small team at the Skunk Works change the way the world perceived aviation, and maybe you weren't either. But I firmly believe that we're on the cusp of another revolution in air power, where the way we think about fighters and bombers, ISR aircraft and cargo planes, even commercial airliners, will fundamentally change once again. And make no mistake, many realms of this aerospace revolution will be led by massive conglomerates like Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman, GE Aerospace and Boeing. But I also believe that with these new technologies, will come a new generation of aerospace juggernauts. Companies that will eventually be massive corporations, but today are nothing more than plucky upstarts with a great deal of technical proficiency and the audacity to believe that they can do something no one else has. So will Hermius be one of them with their quarter horse hypersonic technology demonstrator, their dark horse hypersonic military aircraft, their Halcyon hypersonic passenger plane. I honestly couldn't say, but it sure looks like they're off to a great start. And with that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure to swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.